Well, welcome once again. Um, as you probably know, actually, is there anyone new today? Anyone first time? You're very welcome, sir. God bless you. Um, I was just going to say, uh, I am not a pastor. Uh, I'm not a trained speaker or theologian or anything like that. So you're not going to get any theological acrobatics from me. Nope, there will be no references to the Hebrew or the Greek or the Russian. No, I just have something that the Lord's laid on my heart, and I hope that despite my limitations and I may bumble over my words, that he will speak and it will be clear and it will minister to you um, to his glory. So I'm going to start with a prayer. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may prosper and enjoy good health just as your soul prospers. Amen. Some of you might be wondering, it's an interesting prayer to start with. Some of you might have caught on to the fact that actually that's a verse of Scripture. Third book of John, chapter 1, verse 2 to be exact. This was a prayer from John to Gaius, a gentleman back in that day. It's a lovely prayer, a warm prayer. It's, it's a sort of prayer that you, you pray for someone that you're intimate with you know, that your soul may prosper. I want to focus on that just as your soul prospers. It, it kind of reminds me of love your neighbor as yourself. And you're thinking, how does that remind you of what I've just said? Well, love your neighbor as yourself, in my mind at least, presupposes that you do love yourself. And that is the benchmark by which you engage with others. This prayer, John to Gaius, presupposes that Gaius' soul was prospering. I'm the sort of person who likes to define terms. Because sometimes you get into conversations, you're using a word, but what you're thinking and what the other person is thinking are two different things. Communications breakdown, I think they used to call it. So let's define terms. I'll give you an example, by the way. If you young men back there hiding ever go to London, please do not compliment a young lady's pants. Because in London, these are not pants. Underwear is pants. You get the idea. What you're thinking and what she's thinking, two different things. So, back to the prayer. Just as your soul prospers. What is a soul? Anyone want to define a soul? Or what do you think, a soul? I'm going to bring people in. Now. It's a bit lonely back there. What do we think? What's a soul? Anyone? It lives eternally on forever. Okay. Actually, you can just shout out. I believe somewhere in Scripture the soul. Okay, something between the flesh and the spirit, any others? Okay, let's park that for a while. What about prosper? Just as your soul prospers, what do we think about the word prosper? What do we understand by that? Moving forward? Gaining something? Someone's fruitful? Okay. For the sake of communication, I will say, so, by the way, we're not going to get into theological debates here. Yeah? I will say your soul is your inner man, that which animates you. It might include your mind, your conscience, your emotions, your will, that stuff that animates the body. Yeah? And prosper. Let's just say it's to flourish. Yeah. 
This is just for the sake of communication, right? So I could reword that prayer, John to Gaius. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may flourish and enjoy good health just as your mind, your imagination, your will, your conscience flourishes. Does that make sense? Okay. Just as your soul prospers. Now, it'd probably be a good idea to imagine what does a prospering soul even look like? Anyone? Gratitude to God. Soul that bears fruit for God. Soul that's moving towards God. Has joy. Great stuff. For the sake of communication, I will say that when you came to God, you yielded to him, and a spirit was deposited within you. The fruit of that spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, all of those things, right? When those things start to permeate your soul, which in turn activates the body, your soul is prospering. Now, I'm not a theologian, but does anyone have a fundamental disagreement with what I've just said? No? Phew, that went well. (laughs) Now that we've got that over, can I ask you a question? Is your soul prospering? You don't have to answer that to me, by the way. This is between you and the Lord. Is your soul prospering? Well, that's the message. That's what he asked me to ask you. You can all go home now. See you next week. But before you go... Do you mind if I just share some thoughts about this subject? Thank you. Now, we generally sing that Jesus is the lover of our soul, right? It doesn't take too much imagination to know that Satan is the enemy of our soul. He and his cohorts, he and his demons, do not have our best interest at heart. Yeah? Agreed? As an enemy, it probably also isn't too hard to imagine that an encounter with a being that does not have your best interest at heart isn't going to be very pleasant. If you ever encounter a demon or anything like that, You are in fight mode, or flight mode, depending on where you're at. But the battle lines are usually drawn. You don't like it, it doesn't like you, you know where you stand. But a lot of the times when we think of Satan as the enemy of our soul, we generally don't think, I assert, of the subtle ways in which he comes against us. Yeah? Those sneaky little ways in which he comes against us. You know, Paul, I think somewhere in Corinthians, was concerned that people's minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ by the subtleties of an enemy that disguises himself as an angel of light. Why would he do that? Why would he disguise himself as an angel of light? Why isn't looking mean and ugly sufficient for him? Anybody? Confused? Deceiver? He wants to deceive. It's simple, but it's a brilliant plan. Brilliant. He comes to you as an angel of light. You are no longer in fighting mode. You are in embracing mode. 
don't have your backup, you have your guards right down, and bingo, he's in. He's rubbing his hands together. Where do I start? Now, once he gets his foot in the door, the world is his oyster. Many things he can use to come against your soul. I want to focus on one potentially lethal concoction. What that is, I tell you, when he warps truth and skews perspectives, when Satan comes in and warps truth and skews perspective. Now, as I said, I like to define terms. What is truth? Anyone? God? Truth? Okay. The gospel? For the sake of communication. I would say truth is God's word. But I won't lift up a Bible at this point and say, that's it. Because there's a lot of truth in the Bible that doesn't apply to you. So, I will say, it's the truth of God concerning you. That is what he wants to warp. So, he would like to warp the truth of God concerning Hope Chapel. He won't warp the truth of God concerning you if it's not concerning you. He doesn't care. He knows it doesn't apply to you. I've got an analogy, actually, I picked up from somewhere. What he does. Now, you can see my face. I can see your faces. And if I asked you, do you know what your face looks like? You will answer, you do, you do. If I told you that you have never seen your face before, what would you say? You'd probably say, it's, it's, it's official, he's lost it. Yeah. He's lost the plot. But, think of it. You have only seen your face in a mirror or some sort of reflection or picture. The eyes can't come out of its body and look back at you. You can look at your arms, you can look at it. But you have never seen your face. You look at the mirror and over the years, you get to recognize what your face looks like. You trust it. If you've got a spot, oh wow, I've got a spot right there. You wouldn't have known that without the mirror. Okay? Then imagine one of these warped mirrors. You know, one of those mirrors where you do that and your head is moving all over the place. Right? Or one of those mirrors that make you look thin if you're on a diet. You like those mirrors. <laughs> right? Imagine you have never seen a good mirror ever. And all you've had all your life is this mirror that's a bit warped, making your forehead look big like a Martian. That is a good analogy, I say, of the word of God concerning you. You have never seen your spirit. You have not a clue what it looks like, do you? The only way you know who you are is by God's word. That's the mirror that reflects back at you. And over time, you think, okay, that's me. Yeah, it's the only way you can know who you are in Christ is God's word. What the enemy does quite well is he brings a warped mirror and shows it to you. Now, if you are familiar with what God says about you, when the enemy brings a warped mirror, no, 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 that's not me. That does not look like me at all. If you look at a warped mirror in the natural, you know it's a warped mirror. Unfortunately, some of the times, we're not as familiar with what God says about us or some doubts creeping that he can bring his warped mirror, i.e. the enemy, and you look in it and say, oh my gosh, is that me? Shame. You're walking around in shame. I'm so terrible. But what God sees is something else. When he comes in, well, yeah, God loves you, but you just don't read your Bible well enough. Guess what? That's the one area of your life that you don't know how to get hold of. A good way to warp truth. Right? Then there's perspective. 
how he skews perspective. For the sake of communication, I say perspective, it's your worldview, the way you see things in your mind's eye. Yeah? We talk about a secular worldview, for example. Yeah? Talk about a biblical worldview. If you have a secular worldview, you may be more inclined to take the notion that you were purposeless. You were just molecules, physics and chemistry floating around. If you have a secular worldview, you might be more inclined to kill a baby before it is born. It's meaningless, of course. Your perspective can make the difference between life and death, and I'm not overstating that. One person looks at a situation, commits suicide. Another person looks at the same situation, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. He comes in and skews perspective. Now, I'll give you an example of this. I don't know if you'll remember, two weeks ago or so, Jeff was preaching here. He cited an example. He said that when he came into ministry, the ideal that was set for him, that he saw, was that if you're in ministry, pastoring a church, the ideal is a big mega church. I don't know if you'll ever remember that. But that was the ideal the pastors that came into the ministry were given. If you're not a mega church, you're probably second class, probably inadequate. You have not arrived yet. How did we get to the point where that is set as the ideal at all? So if God has called you to a small local church, your soul is burdened because it's not, that's, not, that's not it. You're constantly trying to go that way for, to the mega church in a direction, but the Lord is saying, no, stay here. The stipulation isn't something that God set, but that's what you're chasing because somehow that's what was um, suggested to you as the ideal. And funnily enough, don't judge by mere appearances did not apply to that ideal for a whole generation. I mean, lots of years. It is so easy for the enemy to skew perspectives. It is so easy for him to warp truth. Bolera will raise a point this morning about Islam or some other thing out there. The enemy is so clever. God is not into monopoly. All roads lead to heaven. These are things that he comes in with and just skews people's perspective and warps truth. Now, there are lots of things I could say uh, about these things. Jesus says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Consider that for one minute. Be renewed by the, uh, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The second bit of it for me is mind blowing because it says, then you will know what is the good, the pleasing, and perfect will of God, i.e., if I change my perspective by the truth concerning me, I will be able to discern what is the good, the pleasing, and the perfect will of God. It is something that will change your world if we can see things the way God sees them. Even things that we take for granted every day that we think we have arrived and we know what it's all about. You don't even give it a second thought. But if you see it the way God sees it, perhaps there's still something I can learn in there. 
Maybe I don't know everything yet. I'll move on. There are lots of things that I can say about this subject. I don't think I can fit them all into one uh, sermon, if you like. But suffice to say that we're dealing with the uh, subject of spiritual warfare here, but just touching it. We know the weapons of our warfare, but it's good sometimes to know what the strategy of the enemy is. If you ignore his, he knows, he knows where we're at. That's why he comes as an angel of light. Because when you come as an angel, that applies to us, by the way. The world doesn't care who, where, whether he comes as an angel. He will be okay just looking mean and ugly as far as they're concerned. But to us, an angel of light makes a difference. We believe in angels. It's a good strategy. There are some things that I have adopted, if you like, in my life that help. Now, these may not apply to you. They're not stipulations or anything like that. But I'll try and get through maybe three of them. The very first one is to ask questions. In biblical speak, you might call it, I don't know, test or prophecy or something like that. Don't just take anyone's word for it, no matter who it is. The um, scripture that I quoted um, referring to Paul saying that the angel comes as, uh, sorry, the, the devil comes as an angel of light, was in the context of the church, the establishment, shooting the church, the body, in the foot. Because there were all sorts of apostles and teachers who were teaching all sorts of things. No matter who teaches it or who says it, test or prophecy. Ask questions. You know, God isn't up in heaven thinking, <gasps> you better not ask that question. Oh, he asked the question. And, and, and he can't answer it. No. Ask questions. You know, sometimes, actually, I ask questions that you might think, brother, I think we need to lay hands on you. Why, for example, is it that on a, in a teaching session like this, I'm not teaching, I'm just sharing, but up and down the length and breadth of this country, not one person asks a question. What you said there, sir, I, I, I don't find that in Scripture. I don't know. It's just a, an unspoken rule, I guess. You may know the answer to that. Why is it that when we come together, up and down the length of this country, not just us, the portion where we all join in community, right, in praise and prayer, focused in on the Lord, is that much of the service? That much of the service is given to one person like me speaking non-stop. But the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. You would think we'll do more of that. Now, I'm getting off topic here, right? I'm just saying things that go on in my head, right? Ask questions. Jesus asks questions. Sometimes you get the feeling that maybe we don't ask questions because we'll get the just because I said so answer back. You know, like a, a child asking a parent, why, why, why? And so if you ask why one more time, I swear I will ground you for a week. But no. Jesus asked questions. They tended to be very revealing. People in turn asked him questions. They were misguided, of course, most of the time, but they still asked the question. The other thing I do is I try and find out what the truth is concerning me. What does Jesus say? Because when you know what the truth is concerning you, not the truth that's concerning Israel or Japan or whatever, what is God saying to me? Do you believe that God can speak to you? He loves you that much that he can speak with you. However he does that, please don't limit but he can speak to you, minister into your situation, direct you on your way. Sometimes we quote scripture and we do not give the Lord room for any deviation or any um, movement. 
we box him in. I'll give an example of this. It may be a slightly controversial, but I'm sure you'll forgive me. The Great Commission. Go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. You know, we know that, yeah? That is the church's marching orders. But check out what Paul said in Corinthians. He said, Jesus did not send me to baptize. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. But Jesus said, go out into all nations, baptizing them. Are you, are, you not, are you not part of that? Further down in Acts, it says, the Spirit forbade Paul from going into the province of Asia to preach. What is that all about? If your perspective is a certain way, you will say the Bible is contradictory. If your perspective is a certain other way, you will say there is the whole narrative. Within that whole narrative, you have your part, and within your part, each and every day, the Lord is directing your footsteps. It's not a one-size-fits-all. But the enemy can come and insist that, yes, because it says that, you have no room at all. The Bible says you were born once and then to die and then judgment, didn't it? Didn't it say that? Or is that, um, that didn't apply to Lazarus. It didn't apply to the little boy that uh, Isaiah, or is it uh, Elisha? Yeah? Rose from the dead? It didn't apply to the boy that fell from the second floor down, the poor raised. Perspective. Understand what it is saying. Otherwise, what mirror? Yeah? Lastly, look beneath the headlines. Look beneath the headlines. In Bible speak, you might call it stop judging by mere appearances. Somebody has maybe anger problems, for example, or perhaps they've got depression. It's all well and good to take antidepressants or go to anger management classes, but it would be even better if you looked beneath the headlines to see what the cause of the, the, cause of the anger is or the cause of the depression. You deal with that, the headlines melt away. Look beneath the headlines. You'll be surprised what you find there. Even in the world, headlines are sensational. They want you to think a certain way. You'll think the world is ending until you read the blurb. All right, okay. For everything that we do, most of the time, there is more to it than meets the eye. No matter how good it looks. Even when we're saying... Judge by their fruit. Even that. Okay, the fruit may look good, but you may not know until you take a bite. You might need to still go deeper than looking on the surface of the fruit to say that's a good fruit. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may prosper and enjoy good health as your soul prospers. The world will give an arm and a leg for what we have been given free of charge. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, kindness, goodness. It is available to us. We would like to see that permeate our soul and in turn Activate the body. The body is useless without the soul. It's got muscles and a brain. But all that action and all that, those motions are uncoordinated until you get a soul. The soul is the one that activates it. And when the fruits of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit permeates your soul, it then causes the body to do good works. Just like your mind or your brain. If it's fed by evil stuff, it's evil. If it's fed by good stuff, it 
comes good. Amen? Um, Bola actually was going to share something earlier, she said. So are you still willing to share that? or She wants to chicken out now. I've just called her up on it. You're not going to chicken out now. You were all mouth earlier. Yeah, hello. Um, I was, I didn't think I was going to share it. Um, I wanted to share um, something based on the word foundations. Obviously, every structure has a foundation that can't be seen. And you build on that foundation. And if the foundation is solid, what you build on it will stand. Yeah. Um, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built. And the rain came down the window. The rain came down and the floods came up. So we are all going to go through hard times. Okay. We're all going to go through challenges. We're all going to go through things that we wish we weren't going through. But if our foundations are solid, we will remain. If our foundations are shaky, when those challenges come, it shows up that our foundations are shaky. One of the things that my testimony is, as a younger Christian, I was afraid to ask questions about things that I was taught. And the reason why I was afraid to ask questions was, oh my gosh, if I ask these questions and the answer doesn't fit what I think it should fit or what I have been taught before, Oh my gosh, does that mean that everything that I believe is wrong? Yeah, so I was a bit, there were certain areas and issues I wouldn't allow to be challenged, okay? The problem with that, though, means that you can end up believing and having foundations that are not right and are not solid. It is better to be open to allow God to deal with foundational things that you might hold on to so that your foundation can be solid so that when the floods come, and they've said that, he said they're coming. He didn't say, maybe if you have floods. When the floods come, that you can remain. So my testimony and my encouragement and my prayer is that we would not be afraid to question. We would not be afraid to look at foundations We would not be afraid to allow the Lord to challenge things that we might have held on to for many years or have been taught by certain spiritual teachers that we feel we need to absorb and accept everything they've said. We need to be open. We need it so that our foundation might be solid and we can stand no matter. Amen. Well, Perhaps we can come to the table and um, partake in communion. Um, we can. Who's serving today? Have we got serve, service today? Yeah. So Bowles, do you want to come and serve? If they, yeah. Right. I'm just going to pray while we do that. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you care for us enough to teach us, to show us things, that you don't consider us just robotic workers in your field. You care for our soul. You said, Lord, that if we come to you, that we will find rest for our souls, that we should learn from you, that you are meek and humble in heart, that we will find rest for our souls. I thank you, Lord, that you say that. As sometimes it feels, Lord, that that isn't in Scripture and we have so much disillusion, restlessness, confusion, disappointments, solical hurts. I thank you, Lord, that you care for our solical well-being as well. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Lord.